Thank you for listening to the Performance Anxiety Podcast on Pantheon Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mark, and today's guest is Felix Bechtelsheimer. And I'm only going to say that once. Bechtelsheimer. His band, Curse of Lono, has a new album out called People in Cars. But before we get into that, we talk about a lot of stuff. And Felix has my unfailing respect and admiration for being completely open and honest about the path that led him to go to rehab, including a harrowing experience in an experimental opioid addiction program in a German mental hospital. But music is one thing that helped pull him through. He wrote over a hundred songs during that period. And soon after, he started his band, Hey Negrita, and Felix reveals why they gave themselves that unusual name. After that band ceased, Felix spent some time studying at the London Film Academy before starting his current band, Curse of Lono. Another unusual name, another interesting story behind it. They've just released their latest album, People in Cars, which was no easy feat. It was difficult for anyone to create an album during COVID, but Felix also lost his father, an uncle, his former partner, and eventually his entire band. But the album is beautiful, and there's even a song inspired by a French punk rocker who robbed a bank, disappeared for 30 years, and then turned himself in. To pick up the new album, People in Cars, wherever you get music, follow Curse of Lono on all the socials, follow us at Performance ANX, and support us, won't you, with a review. Buying merch at performanceanx.threadless.com or with a coffee at ko-fi.com slash performanceanxiety. And buckle up for one hell of a conversation with Felix from Curse of Lono on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Hi, this is Felix from Curse of Lono, and I'm on Performance Anxiety. Um, I am shamelessly plugging our new record, People in Cars. Um, pick up a copy. It's out on vinyl, yellow vinyl, clear vinyl, cassette, CD, um, all streamable um, platforms, and uh, give it a go and like it, share it responsibly. Um, it can be a little addictive, I'm told, so, so be careful. Hey. Uh, hi there. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I got, uh, I'm sorry, I've got one bit new dog running around the house right now and making sure he's getting taken <laughs> care of. <laughs> <laughs> I might have the same problem with the kids running around. I'm, I'm at my sister's place, and there's, I think we've got four, five, six kids running around. So I've gone as far away in the house as I can, but they might come running in any minute. No problem. No problem. Man. It's, you know, I, that's the kind of stuff that makes me laugh. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. If, it. if it happens on my end, I'm like, God, oh, someone took care of the dogs. Uh, be good. We'll, we'll see who lasts the longest. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the first thing before we jump on, I did want to thank you for doing this. This is, I've, I've been enjoying the music. It's, it's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank but you. My first question is, how the hell do I pronounce your last name? Bechtelsheimer. Oh my God. I'm going to let you say that. But it's Bechtelsheimer, but I would stick with Felix if okay. I were you. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I normally go with just Felix from Barcelona. <laughs> I think that's, that's enough. <laughs> we can do that. We can do that. Yeah. So <laughs> what I like to find out to, I guess, understand where you're at now is to find out how you got into music in the first place and, and how it affected yeah. you. Growing up, were you, were you interested in music as a young kid? Were there uh, instrument lessons? Was there a lot of music in the house? There wasn't that much. I mean, yes, my my parents weren't very musical or weren't very interested. My dad had had a nice record collection, but he didn't put it on that much. There was a lot of Harry Belafonte and Johnny Cash and oh, cool. you know that kind of stuff. A little bit of um, Procol Harum and ABBA and things like that. Oh, wow. Um, but it was my, my grandparents were very big. They both played the accordion. Oh, wow. And I, I, I grew up in Germany, so they would play these old German folk songs and, and I would just run around and clap my hands. That's what I'm taught. I don't remember this that well, but I would run around and dance. And I loved, I always apparently loved having music around, but it wasn't, it was more with the grandparents and with my parents. And then when I moved to, I moved to the UK when I was, I must have been eight years old, nine years, nine, nine years old, I think. And again, I, I think I was no more into music than any of my friends. You know, I liked um, whatever was going around the charts at the time. I was yeah. a little bit, they, they did used to laugh at me because I was also obsessed with Elvis and <laughs> the Beatles and the Beach Boys and the Rolling Stones when everyone else was just listening to Bon Jovi and stuff. Oh, yeah. So it was a bit like, you know, that was a bit, they'd, they'd laugh at me a bit. 
But it wasn't until I was, I think I was 14 years old and I was at boarding school and I wasn't having a very good time of it. I really was having quite a tough time. Yeah. And one of the older kids came into my room and he said, come with me. And he took me to his room and he said, right, he gave me a shot of vodka <laughs> and he put on Never Mind the Bollocks by the Sex Pistols. Oh, wow. I, I had to listen to the whole album. And he kept pouring me another drink. And then when we finished the record, he goes, right, one more drink. And then he put on Pink Floyd, the final cut, which was obviously two very different types of music. But it was the first time in my life that I heard music where I went, the lyrics are saying something very profound. Yeah. Um, and in two very different ways. One's like an angry kid saying, leave me alone. Yeah. You know, stick it. I'm not, I'm not doing this. I hate the world. Anarchy, whatever. Pink Floyd was a much more considered, thoughtful approach. But I remember both of them going like, they both spoke to me because I just thought this is just an incredible thing that I'd, I'd never thought of music beyond, you know, baby, I love you. I miss you. I want to be with you kind of thing. Right. I'd never, never got there that, that this could be expressing something much, much bigger than that. And I think that was probably the moment I was, I was hooked on it. Oh, wow. So did that, make you want to, or were you taking any lessons before then were you playing any, any yeah, instruments? I'd taken some piano lessons. I took piano lessons and then they said, well, because I, I didn't speak English when I moved to England. So oh, I wow. had to sort of, they said, stop piano lessons for a term before your exam. So you can catch up a bit. And so I said, okay. And then after a term, I said, I'm back. And the teacher said, look, if I were you, I wouldn't bother. Um, oh. So I, I didn't do any more music lessons after that. I did a little bit of piano and that was, that was it. Oh, wow. So, I tried to join the choir actually at school because um, all the girls were in the choir. And yeah. I just thought, you know, if I if I get in there, um, but they that was when my voice was breaking, and they went absolutely. No. I tried, oh. I tried, I think two or three times. They kept, mate, you're, you're having a laugh. You're not, you're not oh. singing with us. <laughs> oh man, I don't know if you if in the UK if you've ever seen the Brady Bunch, but it's the old Peter Brady yeah. change. I don't know, I don't remember the name of the episode or the song he's singing where his voice breaks, but. <laughs> it's nice to see that's that's universal. So Brady Punch yeah. is universal. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so at what point did you start thinking about playing bands and picking up the guitar and, and playing with other people? Well, I think it was shortly after that when when that kid played me Never Mind the Bollocks and um, the Final Cut, and then I got quite interested in punk because partly because I was very angry at the world and partly because it only needs three chords yeah. <laughs> and you don't even know what names they have. Right. So I, I did a deal with my dad um, in the school holidays. He got, he said to me, look, you always start things and don't finish them. I'm going to get you a Squire Stratocaster. And if you're still playing it in a year's time, then it's a gift. If not, you have to pay me back. And he always said that was the worst mistake he ever made because <laughs> it never it never ended after that. My my roommate got a bass, and yeah, and we just started right then and there, writing the most awful songs, <laughs> making the, the most awful racket you could make. But I've been obsessed ever since. Oh, I mean, did you, were you guys playing out at all at that point, or were you just playing in the rooms? No, that was too early. I think I first started gigging when I was fifteen. I did my first show. Wow! Um, and it was it was amazing. We actually made money. We, we hired a town or village hall, which held about 250 people. And no one came to hear the music. They came because all the 15 year old, 16 year old kids wanted to get with other 15, 16 yeah. year old kids. And that's where all the kids were at. And I think that was actually the case with all the bands I played in until probably my late teens, people did come for the music, but it was a small percentage. I would say most people came for the party. Oh wow! You know, they wanted to. You wanted to go where the girls were, where the boys were, and where the you know where the fun was being had, and where the after party was. Right. So I think we felt good because the room was always full. But I'm, I'm not sure how many of the people knew any of our songs. So, oh, yeah. They remembered the parties. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got to go to the got to go to Felix's party because that's where everybody's exactly. at. Exactly. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. 
Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with the stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Try doing that in person. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And a special offer to Performance Anxiety listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash performance anxiety. That's betterhelp.com slash performance anxiety. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. But it's, you know, that's a thing. I've, uh, there's friends of mine, a band Alabama Three, who are my label as well. Oh, yeah. And they they started like that, you know, before they did the, the theme song for The Sopranos. When they first started, they never got booked for a regular gig. They set up, where, they, they organized their own warehouse parties. Oh, wow. For, you know, two, three thousand people. And it, they, Larry, the singer, always says, we had the best drugs, the best DJs, the best party. And then at four in the morning, these crazy guys with Stetsons, you know, all from London or <laughs> Wales or Scotland with steps and, and sunglasses would come out and play this weird acid house dance country music. <laughs> and they got signed by Geffen, I think, within six months for, you know, it's, and our first record cost a million pounds to make. And so it's, I think I like that idea that, you know, so I, so when you're young, people come for the party. You, oh. know, you have to get good before they come for the music. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. When, when did you start thinking this was something that you could pursue as a career? I think probably once I, once I started learning some Sex Pistols songs and some Misfit songs, I suddenly went, well, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I can learn all three of these chords, yeah. <laughs> then, you know, and, and part of it was because with that punk movement, there was so much of it was outrage. I thought, I know I can be outrageous. I know I can grab people's attention. And I was, you know, a very different person back then. And I thought, well, if I can do that, as long as I can hold three chords down, I think, I was very, you know, at that age, you think you can do anything. So oh, I was yeah. just like, yeah, no, no problem. It then took a little while before you realized that's it maybe a bit harder than you thought initially. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, if you're doing three chords, you got to be one of the first people to yeah. jump on that one. So and f- yeah, you ended up in, starting in Hey Negrita. Yeah. But you're in Florida in, in rehab. How did you get from... Well, in Negrita started just after. So I was in Florida... In, I went over there in 2000, um, and I was, I think, one of my biggest therapy, or the, the thing that kept me going, that kept me motivated. I don't want to say it was the therapy because I had to do a lot of that. Yeah. But there's, I found a lot of people who were, we had all the right intentions and were desperate to improve, get back on track. They struggled because um, they didn't have any motivation, really. Ah. They didn't have anything, you know, you knew, you knew how to survive in a certain lifestyle, certain environment, but you couldn't really see beyond that. Wait one second. I'm just going to ask the kids just to yeah, yeah, yeah. step aside one sec. Yeah, no problem. Guys, I'm in, guys, I'm in the middle of the American. Can you ask me if there's another, if there's another um, loo they can use? Thank you. Sorry, mate. <laughs> no problem, man. No problem at all. Carnage. That's Carnage. Hey, that's what editing's for. Um, is that okay to edit? Yeah. I may even keep it in. That's kind of funny. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll get back to that. So, um, yeah, I think it was the music that was the sort of motivation to keep me going while I was out there. So I wrote probably 100 songs in that first year. Wow. Of which I reckon probably 93 of them were rubbish. <laughs> Um, and it was just about the the process you know and i i would you know i'd get obsessed with the idea of just getting back home to the the halfway house i was living in and grabbing the guitar and you know and just write writing that was all i cared about at the time so then when i came back i started paying the greeter with some um 
a guy who I was in a band with for a long time uh, called Zach Allen, who was in a band called Late Night Munchies with me. He was on guitar. <laughs> and um, a great name. I had a guy called, yeah, a guy called Hugo Hyman who stayed with me throughout hey Negr- throughout most of Hey Negrita. Okay. And another guy who was actually one of my drug buddies. And he was also trying to get his, himself together, but that didn't last very. That was after uh, four weeks. That was just not going to happen. And oh, yes. He had to, he had to leave and um, he got very upset, but it was just, there was no way the two could could work together yeah that's tough and if you don't want to answer this it's totally fine i absolutely understand but you hear a lot of horror stories about why what made people go into rehab was like a lot of you know i overdosed for the third time or something like a near death story was what was it that and made you a, just realize there was a culmination it? there was a culmination of things i think it was a whole bunch of things were coming to a head I had my my ex partner at the time. That's how my it sort of the, the lid got blown open. She was we had one of our friends died who was not into drugs, but it, it triggered a lot of stuff with us. Yeah. Um, that someone so young, he was twenty three, oh, someone wow. like that could suddenly be gone the next day. And shortly after, my my partner of about five, over five years, she ended up in she went to rehab she was staying with her parents for for a few nights and she ended up in rehab having tried to uh, having attempted suicide oh wow and it all got very heavy very quickly and i kept overdosing i had, i think i overdosed six or seven times wow. in the last six months oh my god and that was quite that was quite heavy and there was a lot of stuff just you know, I had no money. I was, I was, I'd go and stay in these um, bed and breakfasts and sort of say, can I pay you tomorrow? And I'd oh. wait till I found one that would take me and then I'd, I'd run away the next day. So it was, life was getting pretty heavy. And I then, my parents helped get me into a, through my dad, through someone he knew, managed to get me in, signed up for this experiment on opiate addiction over in Germany in a mental hospital. Okay. And I did eight days there, which was a proper scientific experiment and it was one of the most harrowing things I've ever been involved in. Really? And I came out of that. Yeah, I came out of that and it was horrendous. I, I, I landed at the airport in, at Heathrow in, in London and I didn't think my parents knew I'd left. And somehow my dad had found out and he was waiting for me at the airport. Wow. And I had lost, you know, a, a lot of weight. I was, I had vomit down my front. I'd been throwing up on myself on the plane over and I was in a terrible state. My dad was there and he just couldn't believe what he saw. And he said, I'm going to take you home. And I had to look my dad in the eyes and say, I can't, I need to go in school now. And wow. I said, I'll come home tomorrow if you'll still have me. And he was like, okay. And he went, he broke, you know, broke into tears and, and walked off. Yeah. And I then took a taxi back into London. I had no money. So I took a taxi, which was about 70 pounds, about a hundred dollars. Whoa. And got the taxi to park up and I ran and hid behind some bins and waited for the taxi. He was shouting down the street trying to find me. And the next day I then went back to my parents and they said, Oh, well, your uncle's been calling. My uncle was estranged from the family, but I always got on with him okay. years ago. And he said, look, come over here. I know some people and, and I went over to, to Florida and that was the end of it. Wow. That, but there was nothing, there was nowhere else for me to go. I had nowhere to go. Oh and my there was no, and, and I was desperate. I'd been trying to stop for two years and I just couldn't do it. Wow. And I, I got very lucky by finding the people I found out in America and yeah. So it was, it was, it was a heavy time, but yeah. it's over 20 years ago now. So. Oh yeah. man, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that though. Because I'm loving the music, and the, you know, it, thank you. It's it, it's a it's a tribute to your fortitude and your strength that that you made it through all that, and you know, you're still here, sober, talking to me about this awesome yeah. new album you guys have done. So, thank you. And I think I read that. Did you start writing a book? I did. Yeah, I did. To be honest, I spent quite a long time on it, and I got shortlisted for. Uh, there's an award over here, which is for where you write, uh, I think two or three chapters and a proposal to try and help people get published yeah. and get the finances to finish writing a book. And I got shortlisted for that. It's a national award over here. And then I got interest from some agents and the truth, I'll be completely honest with you. I was on version draft nine or 10 of this book yeah. and I was reading through it and I, the truth was, I I just didn't think it was 
good enough. The story oh. was there, but it wasn't. There's a difference between someone said to me, you don't get any medals for living it. You've got to turn it into art. And that's what Hunter S. Thompson did. And that's what yeah. Bukowski did. And that's what a lot of these guys did. And I think Hunter S. Thompson or Bukowski could have written a great story about what, what, I, what I've seen and done. Yeah. But I'm not as good a writer as them. And that is the truth. There comes a point when you either just chase that goal of being published or you go, I need to wait till I'm ready and maybe I'll never be ready, but I'm not putting something out just for the sake of it. There's no point. Right. You know, and I think it, it's very, it pains me because I spent a lot of time on it. I think it was very helpful for me. It was very therapeutic to go through all that stuff, but I just don't write the way I want to. Be. Yeah. <laughs> not yet. So I just had to at some point and, and I was getting closer to getting some proper interest, but I just, it wasn't good enough for, for me. It's like, it's like putting out a mediocre album where, you know, where you go, oh, I'm not really hundred percent happy with them. What are you doing putting it? Unless you're a band that's making so many millions of dollars doing it, then fine. You know, yeah. it works. It works for Paul McCartney. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Paul. Um, but you know what I mean? It, he is, it, was, it was just he, not there. He does listen to this podcast quite often. So, Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so back to some music. The band Hey Negrita, The name is from a Stone song. Yeah. Why? How did? Why that song? That's a, it, it's an unusual oh, choice. It was a stupid. It was a stupid. <laughs> it was not thought through. We had a gig. It was some thing. I don't even know what it was. So and so, we got a gig, and we never we didn't really have a lot of songs. So we just like right, we need a name, and. The, one of the guys was like, look, there's too much yeah in rock and roll. We need more hey, hey, hey. <laughs> so it's like, right, I don't know where you go with this. He goes, how about hey, Negrita? And I was like, it was a, it's a rubbish song. And he goes, yeah, but Ronnie is involved. So it was like, okay. And we all agreed we would use that name for one show and then think of something we all agreed on. And then we could never agree on anything. So it's stuck. And after three albums, it's sort of done with it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's, I like that logic. There's too many years. We need a hay. Yeah. That, so that's where we, that's where we came in. <laughs> we provided the hay. Yeah. <laughs> We're in the footnotes you, of rock and roll. You balanced everything out. Yeah. The, Felix Bestos, I'm a contributing part of the hay. The hay, rock the hay movement. So the there's hay the, revival. There's the yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we need the hay, hay, hay's. Exactly. Oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. Now somebody's going to do it. <laughs> One of the five people who listens is going to form a band and blow <laughs> up. So the thing that I noticed about Hey Negrita, and it's actually what runs through all of your music, is the quality of your voice. I love it because it, it reminds me so much of like Mark Knopfler. This is, oh, right. This is, That's a big compliment. This is a beautiful richness, but a little, little, little gruff to it. It just... Mm. it. I mean, it's perfect for the music that you write, which, you know, I, I guess it's natural. I don't know. I don't, I don't write or sing. So I got, well, it's interesting you say that because for me, I felt that I was still finding my feet, especially with those early Negrita albums. And I bizarrely, I feel like with this new Curse of Lono album, it's the first time where I feel completely comfortable with how I'm singing. Oh, wow. And which is really weird. I don't know why that happened, but it's taken me that long. And I'm finding like, Oh, this actually, it's probably because it's the closest to how I talk. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's just, it's like, oh yeah, I'll break into song and come back out of it. It kind of, <laughs> kind of works. <laughs> I like the, and I guess the best word to describe it is the Americana sound of Hey Negrita. Mm. It's, yeah. it's really great. We have pounded against my door. Can't stand the noise no more. Winds howling across my mind. Will we make it to the church on time? And I have a run another road in peace. One Mississippi. I have a run another road in peace. One Mississippi. One Mississippi. So you guys released what, like, what did you say, three or four albums? I know there was a, a live one at the end. Yeah, we did a live one. We did. Um... The first one we recorded was never released. The Minnesota method was never released because oh, okay. we were being we were <laughs> we were being chased by several record labels. And that every time you got, oh yeah, they they're interested in going and recording another couple of songs. And by the time 
you were sort of at that point where it's like, all oh, right, then Riker Disc were trying to sign us, and then they got sold and all this stuff. So by the end, I was already into the next album, you uh-huh. know. So that first one didn't, that was first attempts at walking. So we did We Are Catfish, The Buzz Above, You Can Kick, so three studio albums and one, we call it the Live Acoustic Smokeout. Um, yeah. Burn the whole down, which was just record four hours sitting around in a circle. And it's, you know, I spent time in America, obviously, and one of my roommates out there was, he introduced me to a lot of the country music that I didn't, and it, the, the closest I came to country, I had a Burrito Brothers album. But Ooh, other nice. than that, it was, it, it was the Rolling Stones dallying with country music, you know, that sort of dabbling yeah. with, you know, that stuff. That's as close as I came to that. And the rest of it, I just didn't really, it, it didn't register for me until I then had this, this flatmate of mine who would start, this roommate, he would start playing me these songs, not the records, but him playing them on an acoustic. Oh. And then hearing hearing the lyrics of John Prine and, you know, Steve Earle and Guy Clark. Oh, and yeah. You just go, oh, these guys can tell stories. It doesn't matter if it's only, that's, you know, if it's only very simple songs with the same chord structure, the stories that I then got into. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so as a little bit of an aside, which this, I don't know, this may get edited out because far be it for me to promote another podcast on my podcast, but this guy gets a lot more listens than I do. Anyway, if if you're into old country, if you haven't checked mm. it out already, there is an amazing podcast called Cocaine and Rhinestones. Cocaine and Rhinestones? Did you say Cocaine and Rhinestones? Yes. It's, wow, I'm going to check that out. It's hosted by this guy, Taylor Mahan Co., who's the son of the legend David Allen Co. Yeah. He's got a lot of knowledge about uh, the country music scene and he, he starts from the very beginning and uh, like the origins of country music. And then he goes into Whoa. some of the big stars and he does a season two is basically all about George Jones and the people around George Jones. It's really wild. Wow. I'm not even a big oh, country well, I'm fan. I'm going to check that out. Well, I mean, you know, I've just sort of fallen into it sort of. And then I, I just got, you know, it, it sort of snow. You find a genre it snowballs, doesn't it? You start oh, yeah. digging in, and yeah. So I'm going off on tangents. <laughs> no, that, that's what I love about the the podcast. It doesn't have to be anything. It's not strictly regimented at all. It's just a conversation, and that's how I talk. Everything just goes off on a tangent, and then we circle back around somehow. <laughs> so the last Hayden Agreed album was released in '09, which was the live acoustic, okay. the, the live I'm album. Ready for you, baby. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, we're rolling. Jump right in, a bitter taste. I just can't spit you out. I've been poisoned to the girl for so long. But the first Curse of Lono didn't come out until 2017. So that's what, like eight years or so? Was that when you were wow, writing? I didn't, even, I didn't know that. I didn't know that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> according um, according that, to uh, my that, source here, Discogs. That, that sounds about right, actually. Um, so in 2000, and after the Negrita album, the last one from memory now, we then went and did some more touring the year after. Okay. And I think we, did, we went to South by Southwest and then the American and tour in the UK. So we were still active, but recording. And then when that finished, we I think it's an interesting one. That, that record came out, I think this from memory, the same day as Mumford and Sons first album. Oh. Now, I'm not sure you can check. I may be wrong, but it was it was roughly the same time. And our records actually really well for what we were hoping, really well for us. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Hey guys, I want to talk to you about socks for a second. Why not? It's a music podcast. But I tried a pair of socks from Boldfoot and loved them. I've only worn them once because my kids have stolen them. So in my household, that's the best endorsement I can give. And I guess it's fitting because the design I chose was Jailbait. Wait, Jailbird. The design I chose was Jailbird. We might keep that in. The socks are 100% American made and 5% of all proceeds go to veteran charities. It makes sense seeing that Boldfoot is a family and veteran owned company. 
They have a huge variety of styles. So check out boldfoot.com and buy some of the best socks you've ever slapped on your feet and help veterans while you're at it. That's boldfoot.com. We were the, one of the first bands. We, we used to love and to fest. You know, that doesn't, that didn't happen over here that much. And we used to, it was almost like a, a cause, you know, we need to fight for this, this roots music thing, whatever yeah. it is, folk, Americana, it doesn't matter. Right. We need to fight for that. And there was, I don't know, it, it almost felt like we weren't, weren't the, the ones who'd won the war, but we felt like the war had been won. We were just doing for the right. So that these guys, had, so the cool kids were playing banjo and accordion <laughs> and stuff. And we weren't the cool kids. So yeah. <laughs> there's a part of me that then went off and wanted, I had people, band members were leaving. We had our accordion player went off to be a, a, prof- a, doc- a professor or a lecturer of music at Moscow University. Wow. We had our lead guitarist became He's now a doctor of folk music at uh, Newcastle University. And everyone went off to do these quite, I mean, they were serious musicians. They went off to do these and they, they didn't do it to go and do, they said, well, we've done this now. Now I want to do some academic stuff and do some, so, so, right, see you later guys. Yeah. And I'd written the new, the first Curse of Lono record at that point. So I went in with Ollie Basin, the producer I still work with now. And we, we got the first Three show. We got the first three offers for three live. The first three live show offers for Curse of Lono. I swear this is true. It was New Orleans Jazz Fest, the Isle of Wight, and South by Southwest. And it was all <laughs> off the back of Hayne Greta. People went. We went Hayne Greta. I said, "I don't exist anymore." They go, "What else have you got?" And I said, "I've got Curse of Lono." They go, "We'll take you." Wow. And I suddenly went. I don't have a band. I don't want to get back in the little red van. Do the same thing. I need a break. So I put it all down. And, um, Went off to write this crazy book. Went off and did some just some other stuff, and and then I had somehow got fell back into it. And you know, I got an acoustic baritone guitar that I play. I was walking past the guitar shop. And I saw this thing. I went in and played it, and went. And they go, "Oh, that's on." Think about it. it was, I, I'm sorry, I don't play music. Anymore. It didn't matter. I'm, I said, "I need that." Wow. I went home and then wrote three, four songs in a week and then called Ollie, the producer, and he's going, I haven't heard from you in a while. I said, I'm sorry, let's get back in. And we finished the record and then put a live band together and it started. But there was this big gap in between. Wow. That's, it's so wild for me to hear. I didn't realize it was so long until you just said that. That's scary. <laughs> but, um, but the, and also the, the album came out, the album was then finished, but then we needed, we, we decided to pull some songs off and make an EP put that out. We did a bunch of touring Then we did some more touring Then we put some singles out just to build it up before the record came out. So there was quite okay. a big gap there as well. But yeah, no, there was, there was a lot of stagnation. I mean, with Hayne Green, <laughs> we released an album at least once a year, you know, for the time we were together. Yeah. And then here it, it was, it was a little bit slower. And one thing I noticed about a lot of the releases, they're followed with documentaries or, or films yeah. about the albums and, and the music. I love that, you know, being a photo guy myself, I, I kind of love that. It's a, is that something that's usually brought up to you or is that your idea to start filming it's when you're recording? My, I, well, it's usually I'm, my, I'm normally, I went, uh, I studied at the London Film Academy in, in that break between Aina Greta and Curse of Lona. I went, okay. I think I did a year there or six months or a year and studied documentary filmmaking. So suddenly, and I got really into photography during that time, but oh, okay. I did only analog, so black and white film photography is what I got into. Nice. So I'd, during those years between the bands, I would spend at least two or three days a week in the dark room. And I just sort of wow. needed something away. But um, the documentary stuff, I just get really into it. And I've got this, this friend of mine, Greg, um, who, does, who does most of our videos, most of our documentaries. And he's just such a nice dude to have around. And he just does it all himself. So he comes with a camera, sound, he clips a mic on you. If he has a backpack on him, I always say, what's in there? And it's always the same thing. It's his slippers. So if you're on a video shoot, takes his shoes off, slippers on, he goes, right, now we can work. Nice. And it's just, he's, he's like an extra part of the band. So, um, <laughs> that's great. And I'm, I'm, the guys do wind me up because I love music documentaries. I watch music, I watch yeah. every music documentary going. Oh, so, you too. So I think that's, that's probably another reason why I just love getting some extra film content in there. So when you were working on Curse of Lona, the, the very first album, Severed, you, you know, you mentioned that you did it yourself. 
Where have you gone, my dear? Awaken, you're no longer here. I hear an old man sigh. She don't care if you live or die. Where have you gone, my dear? Don't you lie. But you eventually had to get a band it was together. Me and, it was, yeah, it was me and Ollie bass, and um, Ollie played most of the instrument. I played guitar, but okay. and sang. But Ollie played bass, keys, guitars, drums. Yeah. We had the uh, Neil Findlay who was our drummer for for a long time. He he came in and did a few of the songs. We had a couple of other people do a bit of extra guitar, but that was it. And then it, I had to put a band together to play yeah. the thing live, and we did that. And we did a lot of touring. And then when it came to make the next studio record that was a that was a very complicated piece because i don't do i've tried to write with other people i'm not very good at it so i would i would write and record demos by myself i then gave those demos to ollie and he would sit down with me and we'd make new demos rather than just me on guitar and singing bob dylan style just badly (laughs) um ollie and i would then start coming up with the vibe the beats you know the rhythms the instrumentation and all of that stuff, we'd work on that together. And so that'd be a second wave of demos. That would be the first time the band got to hear anything. That didn't go down very well, but it was just <laughs> the way we did it. And then we went out to Joshua Tree to this amazing studio where we were invited out there. And it was like a boot camp. You know, Ollie would be like with the bassist for an hour going, no, 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 more like this, more like this, with the drummer. And he'd really sort of shape and, and conduct the whole orchestra. Wow. And, you know, so it, it was very, it was a very interesting way of working. I think the others enjoyed it because it's great working with someone like Ollie, but I, I think it's by the time that second studio record was done, they all felt that they very much earned the opportunity now to make a band record without the bloody producer interfering every five minutes. <laughs> and, and I, and I sort of, I was very nervous about that, but I said, you know what, we've got to give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So we went in with all those intentions and um, then this bizarre thing called COVID-19 hit and basically yeah. sank the ship. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it's one of those things. When the band came in and started playing the, the uh, songs for Severed, did you find that they changed much from yes. uh, sound wise? Yes, they did, which frustrated Ollie whenever he came to the band <laughs> live. But I, I just felt that you can't, in what the work we do, you know, this isn't, we're not Elton John or, you know, some, some huge band where you have to play it note for note. You have to let musicians who come in, you have to give them the freedom to find their own space within a song. Yeah. I think that's really important. So it became a rockier affair than the album. It was a much more rock and roll thing and it, and it worked, you know, it was, it was really, it was a lot of fun. Well, I like the videos you did. I, I was watching the one for Welcome Home. Had one of my favorite people, yeah. uh, BJ Cole. Yeah. Back to Bedlam now. I step off the train. Push it in my face. I know it's all the same. Shut the bedroom door. I don't want to hear you more. Slap and wallop, she said. DJ's great. Yeah, he's such a good guy. And I, I really like the song London Rain because it's got this kind of Chris Isaac meets the Doors feel musically. It's <laughs> yeah. so cool. Yeah. I love that song. <laughs> I'm going back down to the city. I'm gonna let my shadow be. Back to the city. I'm gonna let my shadow be. <laughs> talking about how you got you started this 
having an actual band with the second album yeah. as I fell. So yeah. did you have to mentally approach that differently uh, writing since you, what you knew it was going to be a full band at this point? Yes. To a point I had to sort of maintain in my head space for everyone to do their thing. Right. It was quite nerve wracking for me because I know Ollie and I can, if I've got two, three songs and it's me and Ollie going in the studio together, one, I know it's going to be fun. And two, I know it's going to sound better than what I had in my head to start with. <laughs> so to suddenly compromise up, you have to compromise because you can't expect people to turn up with a big smile on their face, excited about the music, go all the way around Europe 17 times yes. or whatever it is, <laughs> and then go, oh, but by the way, I don't really need your input on this. I don't, you can't do that. Yeah. And, and I think we got away with it on, as I felt, I think everyone felt pretty good about that one. I think they all, everyone loved the process and everyone learned a lot because, you know, Ollie is very, he's not, he's not a bossy kind of person. You know, he helps you understand why he's trying to do it a certain yeah. way. And so he gets the best out of everyone. I think by the time we got to people in cars, that, that was a much more complicated beast to, uh, to, to deal with. Well, my favorite track off as I fell is I'd start a war. I mean, that song is just awesome. That's so it's like a dirty blues. <laughs> I love that song. Swaying in the doorway, got the scars out on display. Think I'm right for you in our section. If we're heading down that way. Sandless got me scratching around. Cut the brakes, we're only passing through. Between As I Fell and People in Cars, you've got this car theme going. The, the cover of As I Fell is, is a couple people smooching in the back seat. Yeah. And then uh, the new album, you've got a 70 Chevelle floating over the road, pointing downwards. Yeah. So are you a car guy? Not really. Um, <laughs> I love, I'm not a car collector or, or obsessive. I love driving. Ah. I used to when I was in Florida when I was when I got when I got clean the first six months whenever temptation really hit and you've got to imagine wherever there's a lot of people trying to get their life together there's a lot of dealers hanging around as well oh yeah trying to trying to trying to profit off that yeah and and whenever I got whenever I felt really low I would get my uncle had this Jeep Wrangler and I was down in Delray Beach for a bit and then Boynton Beach down in, in Florida and and I would um. I just grab a pack of CDs, like a stack of Rolling Stones CDs. Yes. And I would just drive along the ocean all the way to Miami and back um, until I felt better. So for me, driving and listening to music is is just one of the most amazing things. And yeah. and Ollie said to me, look, I'd be we we have a lot of reviews always say this is really good driving music. And I then I was with this album, I was looking at life was really good when we started making this record when i started writing so i use photography books to try and get me excited about not excited that's the wrong thing to try and get me in the right frame of mind for writing when you've been okay. touring for a year and a half it's hard to sort of write i'm writing songs again oh, so bad. i like the idea of photos because it just gets you they suggest a story but not too much detail Okay. And they suggest a feeling that you may relate to. And, it, and for me, I just find it as a catalyst. It's quite good. And Mike Mandel's People in Cars was just something. I looked at that and just went, this is just the coolest thing. Yeah. And, oh, that's awesome. And then we, yeah. And I was just like, right, that is the title of the album. <laughs> ah, I like it. Yeah. And Mike is cool with it. I, I didn't know him, but I, I managed to get his email address. And I've been in touch with him. I sent him a copy of the record as well. And oh, he's going, that's awesome that he, that, that, you know, that it inspired that in you. So that I was really pleased with that. That's fantastic. I love hearing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The one thing I haven't asked you yet is the name of the band, Curse of Lono. I know mm -hmm. it's based on a Hunter S. Thompson book, but it's not one of his more well-known books. It's also not one of his better ones. <laughs> 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 it's... um. Well, that was our attempt at being super cool and um, underground. There was a, there was a, they did a coffee table book 
like a big book signed by Hunter and by Ralph Steadman. Oh. And it was a limited edition. And, you know, no one really knew about this book. But we there was one in the studio when we started doing the first Curse Alono demos. And we were looking, the, the story isn't great, but the images are amazing in there. And we just went, this is really cool. You know, no one else knows about this. Let's call the band that. By the time the first EP came out, it was as a paperback in every bookshop, in every <laughs> Waterstones and foils. So you didn't, it didn't, it wasn't cool anymore. Everyone goes, why do you call your band after that book? And I said, well, yeah. I, we thought it was really underground, but it, it just bit us in the ass. It didn't really work out. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time, see, yeah, I mean, I've always dug Stedman's work. He's uh, a, there's a local brewery here uh flying dog and they use yes i've seen those i've seen those yeah they look amazing oh they're so wild and it's good beer so yeah people in cars the now before we get into the music you said you're not uh not really a car guy what's behind the the 70s chevelle floating over the foggy road kind of pointing down to it well i'd love to i'd love to take credit for that but we i was trying to find inspiration for the album cover and i was going through pinterest and websites and all sorts of stuff and i found this image and i went that's my album cover and i tried to track the guy down for it took me a while to work out who, who whose image it was and then it I tried to track this guy down. I got his Twitter. I got an email address. And I messaged this guy for three, four months. Wow. Nothing. And so we just gave up. And we had three different artists come up with album covers for us. They all ended up being used as single covers for the album. Okay. But just as we just settled on another image, um, this guy, Azarik, I think he's from the Philippines or somewhere, email and go, hey, man, I hear you want to use this picture for an album cover. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and he goes, cool, do it. And I was going, okay. And he goes, yeah, I, I do different kind of stuff now. You know, it's yours, not, not a problem. So, wow. it, But it, we, it put us through a lot of pressure. But it was just, I just think it's just the perfect image. So I can have no credit with that image apart from finding it. <laughs> um, it just, I, went, I love the fact that it's people in cars, but there's no people in the car. Right. I love the fact that it's floating and you can't quite work out why it's floating. So it was just one of those, it just fits for me. That is so great. But you had to do this album all on your own again. You're back to where you started with Curse of Lono. Every, every... Well, I started with the band actually. So that it started, we were meant to all go into a residential studio together. And then obviously COVID hit. Yeah. And that wasn't possible. And then we waited and waited. We kept postponing the recording and pushing it back, pushing it back. And then finally we had a window, but it was still very much hardcore COVID time. So it was, we created the bubble, which was me, Ollie based and the producer and Ian Berryman, our engineer. And the others would come in one at a time to do their parts. Yeah. And as a result, rather than going up a gear and having some influence over the sound, they went down a level which was incredibly difficult for them. And I totally understand that. It was, you know, I would have hated to be in their position. I have to be honest, for me, it was difficult as well because I had sleepless night over sleepless night knowing that my band aren't happy. I had just lost my father, what, two months before we started recording. And I was in a very difficult, yeah, I was in, in, it was a very, very difficult time. I lost my dad. I lost a month later my uncle. And three months after that, my ex-partner um of five and a half years as well so it was a very difficult time so to try and manage the emotions of four band members get a record made in lockdown and you know prop up my mom and the rest of the family it was just a lot going on and um so the guys came in and the first version of the album which was 10 songs i think they played on pretty much all of them and so we finished this record and the guys would not happy with how it had gone. They didn't like the sound of it. In mm. some of them, they say, no, that's not what we like. And the label kept going on with it. There's no point in putting a record out right now. It's lockdown. So in that interim, I wrote a lot more songs. And so I called Ollie and said, look, I need to do something. I'm, I'm going mad here, not doing anything. So we went back in just the two of us. I spoke to the band and I said, look, where are we at? And they were all like, oh, I can't commit to touring. A lot of them have got jobs, full-time jobs now yeah. due to the pandemic. 
And I said, are you okay if I just carry this on as a solo thing? And they were like, yeah, no, absolutely. So I went in with Ollie and we had an amazing drummer called Liam Hutton come in for a few tracks. And Joe Harvey White, who played pedal steel, who's one of BJ's students, oh, ex-students cool. a long time ago. He played on the on all the tracks which the band were on, but then we kept him on and he carried on. And then we we made it, I think we recorded another four tracks and they all made it onto the album as well. So oh, we peeled nice. some of the other stuff off. And so it was an album of two halves. That's that amazing. Makes sense. Wow, it did, yeah. yeah. I hate to say that it, that's not an unusual story with the way this pandemic treated everybody. I know. It's awful, but but the album does flow so well. I do have my favorites, though. And the first one cool. is I Think I'm All Right Now. That I love that. That guitar riff is great. love the duet you do with Tess Parks. Yes. How did that come about? How did you start collaborating with her? Oh, that was a strange one. So I'd written this song and it was written as a duet. Um, but I didn't know who I wanted to, to get on that. And I asked Ollie and he said, well, I met up with Tess um, a year or so ago out in, in LA. Um, what would you think of her? And I loved her work with Anton Newcomb, yeah. you know? So I was like, well, that would be amazing. And he messaged her and she came back, and this is middle of the lockdown, and she's saying, look, I'd love to do it, but I don't have a studio here. I'm in Toronto. And I was going, I know, I know someone who I've just, I've just been talking to Mike Timmons from the Cowboy Junkies. Oh, yeah, based yeah. in Toronto. So I was like, Mike, I've got, Tess Parks wants to do a duet. Could you record her? And he goes, ah, oh, I met Tess recently. We wanted to do a record. So it all sort of fell together. Wow. And they did a day in the studio. They sent us the parts. So I, to this day, have not met Tess. Oh, wow. Um, but we were messaging yesterday because we're doing a, we're recording a tiny desk concert and I want to get her to do the duet with me on that. And she's going, yes, I'm in London then let's do it. Oh. So I still haven't met her. We did. And we spoke on the phone and I told her what the song was about. And, you know, because it's a very intense and personal song for me. So yeah. she understood what it was about and she just delivered a stunning vocal. I think. Three is on the sweat machine, we worshipped on our knees A quiver on the polygraph, a shudder of release I'm crouching in the corner, I'm staring at my hands A hard nocturnal point of view, I thought you'd understand You coax me like a matador, beg me to derail Every single moral code you hid beneath your veil The sweat under my wedding band, the wires in my brain we ridicule the deeds we cannot name When the waves come crashing down The colors swirl around That's, oh, yeah. I, I love her vocals. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. You need to, definitely need to do more with her because every, every time you ask her, it, everything just seems to fall into place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then, so from that, you slide right into In Your Arms, which is a very sexy song. So I'm in your arms tonight, left me stone cold on the ground. Just a little scratch, just a little sigh, I feel so reckless, babe. And me undress you with my mind. Is a little strange. Yeah, I love that song. That I'm Thank saying you. that I'm saying that a lot with with this album. I noticed. <laughs> Thank you. But you mentioned the pedal steel, like Alabaster Charlie. He's got that amazing mm. pedal steel. And I thought maybe it was BJ. So the fact that it's one of no, his students, Joe Harvey White. Yeah, yeah. That makes total sense. Going back to the whole theme that you like of of getting in a car and driving, buy yeah. the ticket, take the ride. That is an amazing driving song. That's just a great track to get in and just go. down 
Well, that's one of these songs where it, it's one of the few, I write obviously a lot about my own experiences and that one, it, it's, I, I don't know if, it, do you know the story behind that song? I don't know. Oh, this is amazing. I, I was watching the news, just BBC News, and this article, this little segment came on for about a minute. And they go, oh, a French punk musician from the Camera Silence band who robbed a bank and was presumed dead for 30 years has just handed himself to the police. And I was going, what? <laughs> and they moved on to the, the weather or something. I was, going, no, no, no. I was straight on Google. And I got obsessed with this guy. And this was a band, they were a punk band. It was known as the French Vicious. And they were a punk band. They had a record deal. They had a sort of cult following, made some records, and then got very heavily into drugs. And a bunch of them uh, caught HIV. And they got shot by the label. They had no money. They were anarchists as well. And they were just, it, it wasn't going well. So they decided to rob a bank. <laughs> and they did. That's and natural. they got away with it. They got away with it. And then one of the band members wanted the fame. So he called a local paper and told them who it was. So over the next year, they all got arrested or either they got arrested or they died um, from overdose or, uh, or HIV or whatever. Yeah. Apart from the singer, Gilbertine was disappeared. And I think it was about 10 years later that some of his or something died and they had to sort out the estate and there wasn't much money, but they were, so he was certified dead. They, they, you know, about a death certificate and he was gone. And literally 30 years later, he came across the border from Portugal where he was working in a bar and a port shop, handed himself in. He had a kid and he said he needed to be honest and face music because he would be ashamed in front of his kid. And it, I read this story and I kept reading every interview, every little thing. A lot of it was in French. My wife speaks French, so she had to translate it for me. And I had this dream that I would get Gilbertine to sing the backing vocals on that track. <laughs> and sadly, he passed away at the end of 2019. So I couldn't get him on there. But it was this, it wasn't, a, the song isn't about him, but it's inspired by him. It's, uh, it it take, took me back to my old drug days and that feeling of, I don't care. But at the same time, being all tough, but also being quite scared. And for, but as far as punk music goes, and I loved all the punk ethos, these guys robbed the bank. Yeah. I mean, everything else is hairspray. Yeah. You know, you can sit there with your chains around your neck all you want. These guys actually did it. And they went on the run for 30 years. I mean, that is, that for me was just genius. That is insane. <laughs> I got to look that story up. I don't remember. Yeah, it's amazing. That's amazing. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. So that, that, I guess that brings me to the next song that I wanted to ask you about. Cause I, I don't yeah. know if you can beat that story though. Time Maybe slipping. <laughs> you've oh, had, wow. That's, you've had some yeah. songs that stretch into the six minute mark, but I mean, this one goes beyond that. I mean, it, was, it... Mu it was much, much longer than that. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> after my dad passed away, I couldn't sit down and write about it if that makes sense. I couldn't sit and go, right, I'm going to write a verse and a chorus. It, it just did. It felt disrespectful, to be honest. And okay. I just, my brain couldn't go there. It was, you know, I, it was such a, he, he, he was, it, it was such a horrific night that I was with him the night he passed away. It was so horrific. I couldn't write about it. So what I would do is, I would do stream of consciousness writing uh, where I sit down with a piece of paper and I just write anything that came into my head. Yeah. You know, fan, fancy a coffee. Yeah. Well, you know, what? Any anything that came into your head. And, I, so I, and some of the songs came out of that, but I also did it where I would just, on my little recording, I would just noodle around. Oh, yeah, I quite like that chord too, because I just press record and see what happens. And I'm slipping that the original demo, and I did not, never sat down and wrote the song. I was literally just press record, was just playing around. And this thing started, this recurring chord sequence, and I just started singing over it. And it went on for 23 minutes. Oh my God. And I turned it off, and I went, well, that was a waste of time. And <laughs> you know, went to put the kids to bed or whatever. And the next day I listened back to it and I went, actually, there's something here. And I then spent a few weeks, I sent it to Ollie, the producer, and I just said, Ollie, what do you think? Is there something we can do with this? And he goes, yeah, I think there is. And I said, okay, give me a bit of time. And I went through it more as a conservation piece, but I didn't want to write anything new. I just wanted to preserve what was there, but cut it down. Oh, wow. And so I took the words that meant something, and it was, you know, partly about my dad. A lot of it, the, the, the images I had in my head when I was singing it, brought me to, it was sort of between my dad and my son. So it was that 
wow. you know, weird thing. But it just came out as is. Just I changed the key. Um, I changed the tempo a little bit and I took a lot of words out that just were gibberish because when you just sing anything that comes into your head, you sing some really stupid shit. Yeah. <laughs> so some of, the, some of that had to be removed. And we got it down to whatever it is, nine minutes. Yeah, it's um, just 924, I think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <long>. <laughs> I was Because it's, it's amazing. It's, it's like Curse of Lono's Achilles' Last Stand. Yeah. So, <laughs> well... <laughs> I've loved the album. I've really been enjoying speaking with you. Where where can people find the album and how can they follow you on social media and keep up with what you're doing? Well, it's, it's out and in the States. It's out rest of the world now, but in America, it's out um, end of April and it will be, um, I think, in all good re- record shops. And I'm told it, it's going to be in some bad ones as well. <laughs> and um, Yeah, we're on all the socials. We're on at Curse of Lono Band. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. I don't think we're anywhere else, but who knows? That's um, all you need, really. I mean, after that, it just begins. Yeah, exactly. It becomes a little burdensome, like, oh, I got to do a TikTok. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I think I'm too old for the TikTok generation. Yeah, tell me about it. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you. I've, I know I've kept you for quite a while. It's been a blast no talking with you. It's, it's been a... It's, it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate that, man. Especially with a little interlude. I hope you cut that out. <laughs> we'll <laughs> see. I'll get in trouble with Howard. He's going, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> are you currently putting a new band together so you guys can uh, play live? No, well, Joe Harvey White, the pedal steel player, when I said, look, we need to do some in-store shows and some stuff, um, can you recommend anyone for the band? And he was like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How many, how many pieces do you want? And I was like, I don't know. Should we? Four? It's going cool, right? So we're going to use Tom Sansbury on bass. We're going to use CJ on the drums, and I thought, like, okay, I don't know these guys. And he's going to just trust me. And as I look, there's a girl called Bo Lucas who is has got the most amazing voice, oh. and she's on these Karma sessions that are out on YouTube that you can watch. Okay. And I said to her, look, would you come and because obviously I can't tour with Tess Parks. Yeah. And uh, she's busy doing her own stuff. So I said, would you come do the duet? She's like, yeah. And then I say. Like, do you want to do some backing vocals on everything? And it just sort of works. So she's she's joined the band as well now. So there's five of us now. Oh, man. Joe Harvey White put that together for me, and they turned up to rehearse, and they need the songs better than I did. So, wow. Yeah, I, I, I was happy. They're, they're good players. Oh, that is <laughs> you know, awesome. A, they play in a lot of other bands together, and that for me was quite nice. The previous band, was we were touring so much that it became a very exclusive thing. You didn't, didn't really have time to do anything else. Yeah. And... With this lineup, they're busy doing other things, but when we need them, they're there, and and that's quite a nice way of doing it as well. Oh, that's excellent. Well, mm. I, I hope you get a chance to come over here to play because I, I I hope so very much next year. I think if you get over to DC area, I'm there because I, I Brilliant. love the new album. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed that. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Go back to your family. Will do. Will do. Speak to you soon. Take your time. Run your mind over the wreckage we leave Shoot a glance in the room Like some lonesome melody And the years go crashing by Without a whisper or a sigh And you walk right out the door And you hold your head up high there's nothing to be done It's just a gesture for the ones you left behind 